Okay. Yep. It's fine, yes. Yeah. 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 Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to our meeting. Thank you ever so much for coming uh, to the Berkhamsted Deanery Lecture. And uh, it is good you are here. I hope you're comfortable and have had some refreshments as you came in. And it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Williams. And it was just by chance um, that we were able to organise this lecture. I was at the Greenbelt Festival last year. I went to the Christian Aid tent and heard a very interesting and uh, fascinating talk by Jeremy on uh, structural racism and climate change. And at the end, I, I heard, I picked up, he was from Luton, uh, I said, would you be willing um, to come in and speak to the Berkhamsted Deanery? I said, of course you can say no. And, uh, but fortunately, the answer is self-evident. So we, we are delighted you are here. Um, I bought also the book, Climate Change is Racist, uh, Race, Privilege, and the Struggle for Climate Justice. And I know this is obviously from experience, research, journalism, and numerous things. This is a, a, a life passion. So we are extremely grateful that you're here with us, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you for your warm welcome. Can you hear me all right? The microphone's working, good. Yes, my name is Jeremy Williams. Uh, my parents named me after Jeremiah, who, if you remember, was a prophet of woe. So, <laughs> thanks for that, mum and dad. But if, um, what do they call it, normative determinism? I, I feel like I share something of uh, Jeremiah's problem occasionally. I mean, if you read Jeremiah, there are times when God says to Jeremiah, uh, you need to go and tell the people this. And he says, oh, don't make me say that. They'll, they'll all hate me. And sometimes I feel like in my writing and in my journalism, I come across things where I think, oh, that's really important, and more people need to know that. And people don't want to hear that. So it is heartening to have all of you here in this room who want to have this conversation about climate change and race. And it is a conversation. I want it to, to make that clear. And we can have questions at the end, and we'll talk through some different things and, um, yeah, we'll see how we get on. I'm going to aim to talk for about 40 minutes or so and then have time for questions afterwards. To tell you a little bit about how I got started on this topic <clears throat> and about myself, um, I'm from St. Albans originally. I was born out that way. And my parents moved to Madagascar when I was six uh, to be missionaries. And so I grew up in Madagascar, and then I went to school in Kenya. So those were my formative years. And then uh, I came back to the UK to study when I was a teenager, and I learned about climate change um, at university. And as soon as I learned about climate change, it was being taught as an environmental issue. But my first thought was, well, hang on a second. I can see how this would be very different in Madagascar and in Kenya. And right from the beginning, I kind of... Um, saw it much more as a justice issue than as an environmental issue, and we'll come on to that. Um, nowadays, I live in Luton. I kind of have two hats. I do journalism and um, write very serious books about global topics, and I'm also a children's author. And so today I'm talking to you. Yesterday I was talking to a group of eight-year-olds in Leicester about how big a million is. <laughs> so it's a bit of a portfolio career. I'm also something of an activist on various things, but mainly around climate change and justice. And um, people have different reactions to the word activist. One of the most common is, get a job. Um, but I use the word because I think it's the nearest thing to what I'm trying to do, in that I believe that a better and fairer world is possible, and I'm dedicated to doing what I can to push us and nudge us towards that. Um, I mainly do that through my writing, but I do that through um, speaking and community organizing and social enterprise and um, whatever else I feel invited to get involved in or want to stick my nose into. Um, <clears throat> there are other words I could use besides activist, I suppose. 
I think I, I spend a lot of my time trying to explain how our way of life in the sort of industrialized parts of the world is at risk and at risk of unraveling in certain ways. And when I read the Old Testament, I find quite a lot of the Old Testament prophets basically doing the same kind of thing, warning people away from one path <clears throat> and onto something else. And that seems to be a, a kind of a role of the prophets. And I think a lot of what the Old Testament prophets were doing would be called activism today. And a lot of what activists do today might have been recognized as prophecy in the Old Testament. So with that in mind, I want to talk this evening about climate justice. And I want to focus on one particular aspect of that, which I think is quite overlooked, and that is racial injustice. And then we'll circle back to some Old Testament prophecy at the end. But I want to show you, first of all, the, the thing that I saw that made me think that there was a connection between climate change and racial justice. I was working on a report, um, I can't remember who it was for now, I think it might have been for Tear Fund, actually. And I put these two maps side by side, and I'd never seen them side by side before, and I spotted something. So this is the first of those maps. This is a map of carbon emissions per capita. So it shows where in the world people have the highest carbon footprint. Apologies to anyone who's colorblind, by the way. I forgot when I was drawing this up that red and green aren't good for everybody. But it's too late now. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see, the countries that are in the red here are the countries that have the highest per capita carbon footprints. And yellow and orange are in the middle, and then the countries in green have the lowest carbon footprints. A couple of outliers on the map that often get asked about. Mongolia up here has the highest carbon footprints in the world, which is unexpected. And the reason for that is because it's a very small population that produces a lot of coal, some of which is exported into China. So it's that combination of very high emissions, very small population, means they have enormous per capita carbon footprints. China, on the other hand, has the opposite problem. We know that they use a lot of coal, have you know, a huge amount of carbon, the world's biggest carbon emitter, but also a huge population. So on a per capita basis, they come out yellow, kind of in the middle there. But you can see there's a pattern there with um, some countries that have contributed very little to climate change and some that have contributed an awful lot. Now, this is the second map. This is a map of climate vulnerability. So this is a map of where climate change is going to cause the most harm, essentially. And so here, green means you are relatively uh, less likely to be affected. Everyone will be affected by climate change eventually, but you are not on the front lines. If your country is coming out in orange or red, then you are very much the first to be impacted. Um, as you may know, if you follow the news, some countries um, are already experiencing the kinds of droughts and storms and things that have been predicted for a long time, and now they are coming to pass. If we look at those two maps side by side, you can see that they're, they're almost kind of negatives of each other, um, especially when we look at Africa. You've got this band of red either side and green in the middle on the top map, and then they sort of swap over. And um, <clears throat> what we can see from that is just a very simple it's kind of there, you know, to, for, for all of us to see that this is very big disconnect between the causes of climate change and its consequences. So those who are most responsible for climate change are not the ones who are going to be harmed by it. And the greatest risks are going to fall on those who are least responsible. And that's the injustice of climate change, in a nutshell. There are different ways to explain that disconnect. And one part of it is quite simply geography. So it's much hotter around the equator, and so naturally global warming means more in a place like Somalia or Sudan than it does in Sweden or Switzerland. We have the luxury of living in a temperate part of the world, and we can make jokes about global warming in the winter when it's cold. But if you're in a very dry and arid part of the world, then you're going to have a very different experience. And <clears throat> when we draw the world sometimes, there's a sort of a caricature uh, on the front covers of books or on protest signs, you'll often get something that looks a little bit like this. It's kind of egg-shaped for some reason. It's round on there. Um, we don't draw it as an egg. Uh, but this is kind of a shorthand for, for the world. When, when, when children need to draw it, or you need to draw it for a sign or something, and um, it's sort of a blue world with green lumps of land on it, 
depending on how good your drawing skills are. It may look like the Earth, or it may not. Um, <clears throat> but you get this on proto-science with, you know, there is no planet B and things like that, and in two tones. But of course, that's not what the world looks like. And if we look at the world from space, it looks something more like that. Still not egg-shaped. But um, there's two immediate differences there between our little two-tone world and the reality. The first one is that there's weather going on here. You can see there's movement. This is not a static Earth. There's things spiraling and eddying and moving. And this is a world that's in flux. There's things happening on this world. Um, the second thing is that it's not all green. There's some bits of green, but there's also quite a lot of area which is sandy colored. And top and bottom, they're not very clear here. There are areas of white as well. <clears throat> this is the world as it really is, rather than the uh, planet B of the protest <coughs> sign. And obviously, when you think about it, climate change is going to be very different in those different places. There's a, a writer called Sheila Watt-Cloutier who wrote a book called The Right to be Cold about her Arctic community and how Arctic ways of life among indigenous people of the Arctic were completely impossible now. And so the whole way that they understood themselves, the way that they lived in the landscape was all shifting because it just wasn't possible to do what they had traditionally done. Equally, if you live in some of those sandier parts of the world, your experience of climate change is going to be very different. Um, and I, I always, when I look at this map, I think of that area of green across the middle of Africa there and the Sahel region in particular, which lies between that bit of forest and the the Sahara Desert. How long is that going to stay green for as temperatures rise and as rainfall patterns change? So there's a geographical injustice to climate change just because of the way the world is. Not all the world is green and temperate. And in many ways, and I really felt this when I was driving those beautiful leafy roads between Luton and, and here, in many ways we are the lucky ones. So to come back to our little map comparison for a minute, <clears throat> There is another inequality that we can see on these maps, and that is an economic one. So if you stop and look at, at these maps and you think about uh, rich and poor, uh, wealth and poverty, there's an obvious divide here. You can see that the countries that are most responsible for climate change are countries that are wealthier. So you're more likely to have cars and planes and <clears throat> indoor central heating and fridges and air conditioning and those sorts of things. Um, people are going to use more energy and buy more stuff. Conversely, in um, many parts of Africa and the global south, people have, just don't have as much money and they don't have as much stuff, don't use as much energy. So the rich have a disproportional impact on the climate. There's two sides to this as well because um, although richer countries are going to be more responsible, they also have the money to protect themselves. And that's true locally as well as globally as well. So even in a town like Luton, if we have a big heat wave, uh, if you're earning enough, then you can go and buy air conditioning, whereas if you're in one of the high-rise flats and the heat is rising up through the flats, um, you're at the top and you're sweltering and you can't afford air conditioning. So the richest have a disproportionate impact but can also afford to protect themselves in ways the poor can't. These are not superficial differences either when we look at it from a global point of view. And I'll just mention two countries that I have a connection to. So <clears throat> uh, my mum was from Australia, and I'm uh, an Australian citizen, although I've never actually been there. And uh, Australians have 16 tonnes of uh, carbon emissions per person, their carbon footprint. Long distances to drive in Australia, <clears throat> lots of coal. Madagascar, on the other hand, where I grew up, people have average carbon footprints of 0.16 tonnes per person per year. If you can all see that there. The maths is very easy between those two. Um, Australia's footprints are 100 times larger. Or to put that another way, it takes 100 Malagasy people to have the same impact on the planet as one Australian. So these are not small differences. This is a very big injustice when you consider who's most affected. Madagascar is green on the map there. <clears throat> um, but if we were to look at it on the other map, it would be Dark red, it's a country that's very vulnerable to climate change. Doesn't appear in the news very often, Madagascar, but last year they had four cyclones in a row 
uh, they came much closer together than, than they normally do, and people were still picking their possessions out of the mud when the next one came. And uh, the year before that, Madagascar had a major drought and a famine in the south of the country. There were four official famines that year, and all the others were in war zones. Madagascar's was not in a war zone. It's part of a long-term shift in weather patterns in the south of Madagascar. Possibly to do with climate change, other factors involved as well, but we do know that Madagascar is suffering, and it's uh, not contributed anything to climate change. There's one other thing that we can look at in these maps. <clears throat> Call them back up again. Um, and that is if we consider race. So if we look at that first map, of what color skin people have in those countries that are red on that top map, and it's hard to escape the idea that they are mostly going to be people with fair skin like mine. <clears throat> if we ask who is bearing the brunt of the damage of climate change, and we look at that second map there, it is going to be largely people of color and particularly across Africa. We look at um, this map here, and you can see there's almost a, a, a band of vulnerability that runs from the Caribbean, where there's lots of cyclones and storm damage, <clears throat> uh, right across the middle of the Earth there, and the equatorial regions, some of the world's poorest countries, and then uh, out into India and so on. And <clears throat> the vast majority of those who are going to be most affected by climate change are people of color. This wasn't something I'd ever heard anyone speak about when I saw these two maps side by side, and I thought of this. My first thought was, well, is that right? Is there a racial dynamic to climate change? If there is, why have I never heard about it? Am I imagining this? Um, and I went away and I had a, a, look, a look at it, and I researched it, and it ended up becoming the book, uh, Climate Change is Racist. It's not a book that I wanted to write. It was more a book I wanted to read, <clears throat> but no one else had written it. And I, I talked myself into writing it and then back out again. And then eventually I did write it. Um, and now I have heard quite a few people say that there's a racial dynamic to climate change. There's quite an interesting conversation around that happening. There are a number of people um, in America where this was always a much more common message. Um, and it is gradually gaining acceptance that there's something we need to look at here. But before I go any further, <clears throat> it is quite a difficult title, Climate Change is Racist, because that's not how we understand racism normally. Climate change isn't a person. How could it possibly be racist when it doesn't have opinions, doesn't have prejudices? So it's important to recognize that there's more than one kind of racism. When we talk about racism, what we're normally talking about is racial prejudice, <clears throat> which is the actions and opinions um, of, of racists, and we kind of know what that looks like with racist football chants or offensive comments on the internet and those sorts of things. Very few people will kind of openly identify as that kind of racist because it's not really socially acceptable. Um, uh, but if that's our only understanding of racism, then we're missing a lot of other things. And we can very easily make casual statements like, well, it's not like it used to be and so Britain isn't a racist country anymore. But there's clearly something deeper going on because even though most people aren't openly racist, there are still visible racial inequalities when we, go, when we look for them in things like education or in policing and sentencing and in healthcare. And when I was researching this, it didn't go in the book because there wasn't anywhere for it, but <clears throat> I learned that in Britain, black women are four times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. Now, we can't just say black women are bad at giving birth to babies, and we can't say that midwives are racist. There's something going on there. There's something in the structures of the NHS, of housing patterns. Of, of, there's something going on there that, that, that is causing this injustice, this inequality. <clears throat> and whenever we see that kind of a difference, what we're looking at is a, a wider form of racism. Um, that's often called institutional racism. And this, as you might remember, came to prominence as a term during the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. And they defined it as the collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, culture, or ethnic origin. The idea goes back a lot further than that. And um, two gentlemen 
called uh, Charles Hamilton and Kwame Ture uh, coined it in the 1960s. And they gave this useful definition, which I really like. They said that when somebody throws stones at a black family's windows, that's individual racism. When that family can't get a mortgage to buy the house in the first place, that's institutional racism. Only one of those is visible. The other one's buried away in the system. And that's a really key point. There is a third kind of racism, kind of that overarches all of those things, and that's structural racism, <clears throat> or systemic racism, it's sometimes called. And these are the patterns of disadvantage that emerge from the overall functioning of society and of the system, and they're often accumulated over centuries. That's what makes them so complicated, because it's inequality at its broadest and also its most invisible. And it unfolds through these structures rather than through people's actions and attitudes. The problem with structural racism is that the explicit prejudice might have happened a long time ago. And it doesn't need visible racism to perpetuate it. And so the American sociologist Howard Winant says that racism must be understood in terms of its consequences, not as a matter of intentions or beliefs. Climate change is an example of structural racism. And that's really important. I don't believe there's anybody that wants to deliberately oppress Africa by warming the climate. That would be intentional racism. And we, we're not talking about that. That's not possible. <clears throat> but because climate, the climate crisis will harm black and brown people most, while they've contributed the least to the problem, there's a structural injustice there. So if we were to think about why this is, <clears throat> um, Perhaps it shouldn't surprise us in that this state of affairs does just reflect underlying global power structures in which wealth has been extracted from the global south and has flown, uh, just flowed to the global north. And things we don't want often flow the other way, whether that's our plastic or last year's fashion or our waste obsolete electronics. Or if some politicians get their way, the people who come to Britain for refuge will be sent away to the global south instead. If we were to wind back 100 years, there's another map for you. <clears throat> this is the world in 1920, and countries that were colonized in 1920 are in green. And uh, so 1920, um, Ireland had just become independent of Britain. Norway still has its colonies up in uh, Iceland and Greenland, but otherwise there's really no colonized countries in the global north. Spain has left South America, so there's no, no colonies over there. Um, then you've got a few outliers like um, Japan in Korea and America in the Philippines and most, most those sorts of things. But if we look at Africa, the whole continent is colonized apart from um, Liberia and Ethiopia, I believe. Most of the Middle East is occupied and right out towards the um, Indonesia, the Dutch colonies in Indonesia. Why is this relevant? Well, if you compare this to the map that we saw earlier of carbon footprints per capita, and you can kind of see the pattern there if we put those side by side. There's a recurring pattern. Whether or not countries are officially independent of external control, and they're not colonies um, anymore, the underlying power structures of the global economy might not have shifted very far. Um, some countries are still poorer than others, and that very much echoes that old colonial pattern. The majority of white countries, the colonial forces in many cases, um, are still the richest and still hold the most power, and are still in many ways taking what they need from others. It's just gone from taking land, to taking resources, to now arguably taking more than our fair share of the atmosphere. But it's still taking something that we're not entitled to from others in other parts of the world. Now, colonialism and slavery before it, we could recognize those as being, at least in part, um, racist structures, racist processes. The empires told themselves that they were bringing civilization and education and religion and, and these good things, but they were also justifying the extraction of wealth from the global south. And we can see the racial dynamic in that. 
We don't really talk about racist processes in global politics now, but the power dynamics are very similar. The underlying structural racism that we see in colonialism has carried on into climate change. And so climate change echoes the same racial hierarchy that we saw in colonialism and slavery and so on. To give a specific example of that, <clears throat> every year the world meets for the UN climate conferences. Uh, so we had COP26 in Glasgow, if you remember, and then COP27 in Egypt last year. And I can't remember where it is this year. Um, there'll be another one. Um, and every single year you have delegates from Africa and India and from small island states who will leave that conference going, nothing was achieved, we were betrayed, we were not listened to, we were overruled, we didn't get our way. Um, <clears throat> Because the conferences clearly follow the agenda of the richest countries and the most powerful countries, which are the former colonial powers. So if we were to take the example of the target on global warming, which is to stay um, at two degrees of warming, if you were to go back 15 years ago, you'd have found climate negotiators from Africa saying, we have to limit warming at one degree. That was what they were asking for. And then when it became clear that one degree was not going to happen, they rallied around 1.5 instead. And you had these big campaigns around 1.5 to stay alive. This is, this is you know, the absolute minimum that we will settle for. <clears throat> but the Paris Agreement went for two degrees of warming. What sacrificed between 1.5 degrees and two degrees? Africa and the small island states, some of which will no longer exist at two degrees. So what you have in the Paris Agreement, which is like the high point of global negotiations on climate change, is an international treaty that says, we promise to save ourselves here in the rich world. And if we can manage it, we might have something left over for Africa and for the small island states. I think that's appalling when you think about it in those terms. And again, no one did say it in those terms. It was not about racist intent but the power structure of the global economy are tilted towards some parts of the world and not towards others. So if we think about, um, if we think about this, two degrees of warming, we will protect ourselves, but we will not be able to save many people in Africa. Do black lives matter? And that's a phrase that we normally associate with police violence, but in climate negotiations, do black lives matter? I think it's a relevant question. Where are we next? <clears throat> yes, I'll skip over that bit. This is um, Vanessa Nakate. She wrote a great book that came out last year, or the year before. And uh, she's a climate activist from Uganda. And she compares climate change and uh, vaccine inequality during the pandemic, where you had countries like Britain and Canada and the US that had stockpiled enough to vaccinate everybody four or five times over, just in case. Um, while many countries in Africa had, uh, were yet to get a single dose. And the, what she says is that these injustices are a byproduct of poverty, limited political power, and in essence, of most lives in the global north being valued more highly than those in the global south. I think that's quite a striking phrase, lives in the global north being valued more highly than those in the global south, to hear that from someone um, in Uganda. As Christians, we know that everyone is made in the image of God. We know that there is um, neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, black or white, that we're all one in Christ. But global power structures don't reflect that. And the, the structures of the UN and the way that we're negotiating climate change doesn't reflect that. In those systems, some people's lives really do matter more than others. And what it means is that as climate change unfolds and it gets worse if we don't succeed in stopping it, <clears throat> then what we've essentially agreed in those international negotiations is that the lives and cultures of people in Africa and the Caribbean and so on are less important than the right of already very wealthy people in the global north to make even more money and not to have to be challenged about the way we live. That's a hard message, isn't it? That's, that's Jeremiah for you. <laughs> but we have to talk about these injustices, even though it makes us uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable. 
because otherwise these racist power structures will continue to shape the outcomes of climate change and the way that we address it. Um, just a quick message on that, on, in terms of where we're going. When I say the outcomes from climate change, what are we talking about? Here are four different outcomes of climate change. Again, four maps. They all reflect the patterns that we've already seen. I'll run through them just quickly. The first one up here is heat risk. So, as we know that the world is warming, there are temperatures that the human body can handle, and the natural processes of cooling, like sweat and so on, will cool us down, and then you can get deadly heat, where it's so hot and humid that the body can't actually cool down naturally, and you need to be having a cold shower or be in an air-conditioned room, or you're at a very serious risk of, of, of death. This, these are the parts of the world that may experience deadly heat risk um, by 2050. There's none in that map. Um, there's no majority white cities in that map that I can spot, other than Darwin over in North Australia there. People who will be exposed to deadly heat risk, where it will be so hot outside that you can't go outside, <laughs> or you risk dying if you're out there for long. That's entirely going to be experienced by people in the equatorial region. Crop failure. Places that are in red here are places that are going to see their, uh, a reduction in crop yields. Places in blue are likely to see um, the same or better. Um, this is average across lots of different crops. Um, and again, these are places that already struggle with food security in India and across uh, Central Africa there. And yet it is those places that are most likely to see a reduction in yields because of climate change. Over on this side, it, we don't have a cyclone season in this country. When I was growing up in Madagascar, we did have a cyclone season. Um, this is a map of all the cyclone routes, all the routes taken by cyclones blowing in off the sea um, since 2000. I've colored Madagascar in because you wouldn't be able to see it at all because it is hit by so many cyclones. Um, many parts of the world don't get cyclones, but those that do are experiencing stronger ones. It's not more of them, as far as we know. That's not an effect of climate change. But when they arrive, they arrive with more force. And so they're more destructive. Um, and then finally, this one, this one's a real kicker. I, I, um, I always stop and think about whether I should show people this one or not. This is a map of uninhabitability. And this is for 2070. The areas in black here are places that are uninhabitable now. And they're mainly in the Sahara Desert. There's the grayer area are places that will be uninhabitable in 2070. And as you can see, there are large parts of the world where it just won't be possible to grow crops or raise livestock. And that's what they're considering to be uninhabitable. If you can't produce food, you can't live in that place without artificial means and importing everything. When you stop and look at how many people live in this gray area across the world by 2070, there are 3.5 billion people living in parts of the world that may be uninhabitable by 2070. Now, this is a projection, not a prediction. God willing, we don't end up with that. But what if it's half as bad as that? What if it's a quarter as bad as that? What if we, on what if we only have 1 billion people displaced by climate change rather than 3.5 billion. It's still horrendous. And it's almost impossible to imagine, I think, um, 3.5 billion people being made uninhabitable by climate change. Where do those people go? Who's going to take them in when we have such political difficulties welcoming refugees as it is? It's the sheer vastness of the human suffering involved in that is hard to fathom really is. And, as we've been saying, of those 3.5 billion people, a small fraction of them will be white people. If this unfolds in anything like this, then climate change will come to be seen in history, I think, as another racial atrocity, like slavery and like apartheid and those sorts of things. This is a very hard thing to hear, I recognize that. But I do think that climate change is the great injustice of our generation. Previous generations of Christians were called to take a stand on 
the abolition of slavery or uh, segregation in America or apartheid. And there were, in all of those places, there were those that worked for justice and there were those that did not and thought it was nothing to do with them. And so the church's legacy on oppression and racism and so on is quite mixed. I think this is a time to take a stand on these sorts of issues. Are we going to fight for a safe climate for our brothers and sisters in Africa and Asia and the Pacific and the Caribbean? And will we hear those voices of those most affected? Or are we going to stand by and equivocate? I think future generations will look back and judge us for the decision that we make on that. Now, how, how we act is a matter for each of us to, to think about. And there's lots of different roles. Um, I don't expect many of us would want to go and uh, glue ourselves to, <laughs> to a bridge or disrupt the snooker championships like the Justice of World people do. There's lots of ways to intervene. Some of us may be called to do that. That's, uh, that's for you to work out with your own conscience. Certainly, if we're going to be looking at our own carbon footprints, we can have a limited impact in what we can do with changing our own personal lifestyles. It's a start. We can improve our impact if we work at a community level instead. Think about what we can do as a church, what we can do as workplaces and schools and those sorts of things. And I think in all of this, we need to work for social and racial justice as well as working on the environmental side of things. Um, supporting anti-racist solutions to climate change. And maybe you'll find a role in Just Stop Oil or Insulate Britain as well, who knows. Whatever skills you have or influence you have, there is a role to play in the greatest injustice of our time, I think. And we can talk a bit about solutions later if you want to. I, I realise that this is, this is a difficult stuff to talk about, and um, I don't want anyone to feel like they're being made to feel guilty or being blamed for something. That's not my point. I'm also a white man, and I don't take responsibility for... I don't, I don't feel blamed or guilty for colonialism and empire and so on. I wasn't there. We can still take responsibility for it, even if we weren't directly you know, in charge of those processes. Um, <clears throat> the Puerto Rican scholar Eduardo Bonilla Silva describes structural racism as racism without racists because it keeps going without anyone deliberately perpetuating it. And that's why we need to talk about it, because it will be invisible otherwise. That's what's difficult about it. We have to be proactively anti-racist. Justice is something we have to work at. We have to make things right. And if I can quote someone who doesn't get quoted very often in church, then um, this is uh, something that Malcolm X said <laughs> in 1964. If you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, that's not progress. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. Progress is healing the wound that the blow made. And that brings us back to Old Testament prophecy because I think I can see something similar to that in Isaiah <clears throat> chapter 1, where he says, Stop doing wrong, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. There's a couple of quite interesting things to notice in those two little verses. The first is that it's all active verbs. Stop, learn, seek, defend. Justice is something we have to work for. It's something we have to fight for. So we might paraphrase this for racial, the racial justice context and say, stop being racist. Learn to be anti-racist. You can also see that there's a, a process going on here. Justice isn't something that's switched on and off like a light. It doesn't just disappear when oppression stops. We have to seek it. And Isaiah suggests his listeners have to learn to do right. You might not know what to do when you first start thinking about this stuff. You might, as I found when I started working on the book, I didn't have the language to describe these things. I didn't know if I was allowed to talk about them. You have to learn to do it. It's not instant. And injustice has to be rooted out because it can be deeply entrenched. Healing and restoration will take time. This is true of the climate crisis and it's true of the struggle against racism. Both of them are a struggle uh, that are going to go on for a long time. We need to look at our 
fossil fueled way of life, and we need to learn to live more in harmony with creation and its patterns and its rhythms. We need to seek a fairer way of life. And for me, that's part of my discipleship as a Christian in 2023. It's part of what it means to live faithfully in response to our time. We need to defend those who face the greatest risk from the climate crisis, take up their cause, and plead the case for climate justice. And I hope we're able to do a little bit of that here tonight. I'm going to stop there, and we can have questions. Yes, There's, I've got a roving mic here, so we can, uh, if you want to use that. Sorry, can I make a plea for those of us who are... Yes, yes, there we go. <laughs> On the map, it yes. showed America red and Australia red. Yeah. And Mongolia and one or two. Why isn't Europe red? Yes. So the reason that um, Europe isn't red there is because um, American ways of life are much more polluting than European ways of life. Um, our carbon emissions in the UK have come down considerably. They peaked in the 1970s at some point. So we've made a lot of progress. Um, France, you have quite low emissions because they use a lot of nuclear power and so on. So you do have much lower emissions in Europe. They're still not anywhere near the level they need to be for everyone to have an equal share of the carbon, if you like. But compared to where many other parts of the world are in America and in Australia and parts of the Middle East, then they're relatively low. Yeah. It does depend on how you color the map, of course. You could use a different scale, but yeah. Yes, have the microphone. Thanks very much. Um, I'm, a question about the responsibility map. Mm. I see that Australia is in the bad boys group. And I imagine that's because they export an awful lot of open coal uh, to other countries, including China and India. Would it not be reasonable to share some responsibility the nation that burns it yes. as well as the nation that digs it up? Yes. This is a, an ongoing debate in climate negotiations because at the moment you're only responsible for uh, the, the carbon that is burned in your own country, but not for the things that you import, yes. So there's a lot of coal that is dug up in Australia that is exported to other places. They also burn an awful lot there as well, and Australia has been very, very slow to adopt renewable energy, which is a shame when you have so much sun in Australia. Um, they've been very slow. They're catching up slowly on that one. But um, we also have that problem in the UK because we run a trade deficit, an awful lot of the stuff that we use has come from China, and yet the emissions for all of those things are on China's account and not on ours. So I was just saying that Britain has lowered its emissions, that's true, but if we were to add on all the things that we import, we'd have to add a third back onto our emissions. And this is why a lot of countries have resisted incorporating those imports and exports into global carbon accounting because it makes us look bad, it makes China look better, Let's not do that. <laughs> There's an ongoing negotiation there. Britain does at least measure what our total emissions are if we include imports and exports. Most, most countries don't, but we are at least counting it. On your, on your map of African, African states, there's lots of minerals there which are exported to places like China yep. and Russia and all the uh, Russian Federation. And a lot of their employees come from those countries not using um, native... Um, productivity. Yeah. So is that a cause of the colour, the difference? Because they're taking all the minerals that they could use. For example, the latest um, battery charging making thing for electric cars. That was going to be in the United Kingdom, but it could have actually been in Africa quite easily because the minerals are there for it. Yeah. Is yes, there is an enormous mineral wealth in, in Africa, and most of that is, is exported other parts of the world for Chinese manufacturing and um, also for, for all sorts of things that 
um, end up in the UK. I used to live in, in Kenya, not far from Lake Naivasha. Lake Naivasha is very famous for growing flowers and green beans and things like that. They're all for sale in Marks and Spencer. <laughs> Valentine's Day, all these roses are exported using Kenyan water from their lake, which is going down every year, uh, to grow roses for Valentine's Day in the UK. The reason that, um, the reason that African countries have such low carbon footprints is predominantly poverty. And one of the reasons that there is enduring poverty in many parts of Africa is because of unfair trading systems where people don't get the benefit of their own natural resources. There's a huge problem in Madagascar as well. Madagascar has immense um, natural resources of, of hardwoods and oil and diamonds and all sorts of things. And uh, they all leave tax-free through corruption and um, black markets and so on. Uh, it is a big problem. And so poverty endures. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I was slightly surprised that in speaking about the developing situation over so many years, you made no reference to the fact that occasionally we've had things called wars which have managed to significantly affect the level of population in many of these countries. Um, added to that, you also um, make no reference to what happens within a country. I mean, the Chinese have managed to have uh, um, the Great Leap, which managed to um, eradicate a large number of people who were obviously sur surplus, at least considered surplus by the Chinese government, and the Russians didn't do too badly in the 1920s as well. Uh, yes, that's true. I haven't referenced um, wars and conflicts in there. Um, in terms of global climate change and where we are now, there's not many of those historic conflicts that would have, would have a direct impact on where we are in the climate now. You c I could show you, and sometimes in talks I do this with um, Britain's carbon emissions and how they've risen and fallen over the decades, and you can see the impact of uh, the world wars and carbon emissions come down as sort of industrial production collapses in some places and then it rises again as you try and pick up after the war. Um, but yeah, but in terms of the, where we are now with the climate, so much has happened in the last 50 years as the use of fossil fuels has accelerated and spread around the world that those, the impact of those wars kind of pales into insignificance, horrendous though they were compared to the impact of the last 50 years of fossil fuel use. So, for example, in China, if you look at uh, the, the horrendous conflicts that happened in China in the past, but you look at where its carbon emissions come from, and they're almost all since 2000, where coal use just explodes in China. And so if we're talking carbon emissions, then, then it's, it's more recent than a lot of those things. But they're not insignificant, and they do matter historically. Yes. So are there any um, environmental campaign groups, that, you know, things like Friends of the Earth, um, Greenpeace, that you feel are starting to talk more about racial injustice alongside environmental issues? And you say, which ones? Yeah. I feel like campaigners at an individual level are actually aware of this, but at a, you know, environmental organisational level, it'd be great if you could share your thoughts on that. Yes, certainly. Yeah, so this has been um, an interesting conversation. As I was saying, I'd never heard anyone make the connection between climate change and race. That's just partly because of the circles that I moved in. It turns out that there's been a long conversation about this in the States. It's part of the environmental justice movement for decades, which I just wasn't really aware of. And then I, I caught up with that. So in the States, this is a much more active conversation. In the UK, um, Greenpeace have done some interesting things on this, and they've produced some new reports that are specifically looking at how we respond to climate change in an anti-racist way and how we tie these things together. Um, both Tear Fund and Christian Aid within the sort of Christian environmental world have both looked at this. I've spoken to both of those organizations at length and done um, events for their staff and so on, and they're really interested in this whole thing because they, they work in Africa alongside African communities that are suffering from climate change right now. And when they come to understand that climate change has been caused by the people who've come from the other side of the world to help them, 
well, explain this to us. <laughs> um, so they have to be able to account for this kind of thing. So they're taking it seriously. I think the organization that gets it most of all is Fridays for the Future, or Fridays for Future, the, um, the youth strike movement, unexpectedly. But if you read their statements when they call for global strikes, they are really explicit about it being in solidarity with parts of the world that are suffering, that there need to be uh, reparations for climate change and also for racial injustice. And they're using ways of framing this that no one else is really doing. So they're really interesting. Yeah. And that's an interesting one. If, you were to say, if you'd told me five years ago that there would be a global movement of young people talking about climate and race and anti-racist solutions to climate change, I, I wouldn't have believed you. But, you know, the youth strike movement does get that. Yeah. One over here and then back here. Uh, thank you for an absolutely devastating um, talk. Um, but I think there's a, there's a real translating that perception into action mm. and winning majorities in democracies is a very difficult business. And the use of the term racist in this way is likely to alienate large numbers of people who you wish to uh, convert to accepting the realities that you've outlined. And I wonder whether, therefore, racist is the right term. You could, and we're talking about specific parts of the world, and I think the idea of racist, uh, you could almost make geographical descriptions rather than racist ones. I just wonder this, this ha whether the use of such terms actually can be counterproductive. Yeah. They may be right, but they won't win you the argument. And what you're talking about is not convincing small groups of activists. You're talking about convincing enough people to make politicians accept that we will have to reduce effectively our standard of living. So that the political process of that transition is extraordinarily difficult. And the danger is none of us want to accept this because of the consequences to ourselves. When it's presented as you presented, it, it's undeniable. But to when you add the language of racism, people react against it. I don't know what the answer to all this is, but I think it's a significant yeah. problem. No, I know where you're coming from. And uh, what I said right at the beginning, that I, I thought about writing the book, and then I talked myself out of it, and then I talked myself back into it. This is exactly the conversation I had. Is it helpful to talk about it in, frame, in this framing, um, which is obviously one of many ways to talk about climate change? Um, or is, is it a contentious enough topic already, the whole area of racial tensions? Don't bring climate change into it. Don't make it more complicated. Um, the, 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 the reason I ended up writing it was because it, it's the truth, and we shouldn't hide from that. And if something is true and is being ignored, and there is an injustice that is not being talked about, then I feel that it's right to say that. Whether it's right to campaign on that and make it a huge part of the conversation, I don't know, and I don't know if that is helpful. But it has to be said, and especially if you stop and you think about it from the perspective of someone in Kenya or in Uganda, as in the quote that I had there, if you stand in someone else's shoes, they would say, yes, absolutely, you need to talk about this. And because what are we protecting if we decide that we're not going to talk about it? We're ultimately protecting ourselves and our own feelings about it. We don't, if, we, if we don't want to have the conversation because we're afraid of upsetting people, then I think we need to be more courageous. Well, the argument is how you have the conversation. Yes. Not you show that we have to have the conversation. Yeah. My question to you was how do we have a conversation which brings yes. the maximum number of people yeah. so that democratic leaders would be prepared yes. to take and, and that I don't know, other than to say, I will endeavour to have this conversation with anyone who will listen, and to approach it with humility, and to approach it <coughs> with an open mind, and we'll see where we get to. But I think we, we just have, we, uh, for me, it's really important that we don't run away from awkward conversations, and things that make us uncomfortable, and that we find ways of talking about it that are compassionate, and that are, you know, 
that get, that get us somewhere. Now, I don't know if that conversation is happening yet, but I think it has to be worth trying. Yes, one over here. Thank you. I was just thinking when you were talking about parts of the world where water's being weaponized in racial conflicts, yeah. particularly thinking of the Holy Land and around the Nile, and I was just wondering if you could talk about that in terms of where climate change is feeding into that um, and just what your thoughts about that are, because it's definitely yes. being weaponized. Yeah, for sure. And this is a, a huge problem where you have, in particular, where you have rivers that flow through more than one country. <laughs> and uh, if you take all the water off into your dam and you leave nothing for the, the country downstream, uh, or if you put pollution into it and it flows into someone else's country, that, that is a real problem. That, those are very difficult situations. And yeah, they can be weaponized and used, used against cultures that are seen to be the old enemy or different from, from you. I suppose the question is, is climate change contributing to that becoming increasingly a battle? It, it is, because water becomes um, more precious. And so if you are one of these countries, with the Nile, for example, if you have lakes and rivers and other water sources that are drying up, if aquifers are falling, then the pressure from your own people, your own farmers, your own industries to use the water that flows through it just goes up. Um, and so you might take the easy political win of tapping that resource, even if the consequences will fall on someone else. We've, we've got those problems in um, the Aral Sea is obviously one of the kind of iconic examples where there are three countries that border the Aral Sea, I think. Um, and in, you know, who, the river was diverted off into the, the cotton fields of um, Kyrgyzstan. I'm going to get this wrong. Um, I think it was Kyrgyzstan, at the expense of Kazakhstan. And climate change will make those much more likely to happen. It will increase the pressure on all existing water sources. And that's going to be a growing problem. You've also got the problem, as I just mentioned with Kenya, where you've got places that are using their water to produce things which is then exported. I wouldn't want to go to Kenya and say, you need to stop exporting roses to Marks and Spencer and keep your own water because those are people's jobs. Um, and yet, those water levels are falling. And how long can that carry on? They're very complicated problems, which is why stopping climate change and not having to deal with the crisis is, the so, is so much more important. The same when I was talking about 3.5 billion people potentially having to move off their lands. Well, let's just make sure that never happens by stopping climate change now, or as soon as we can. Any questions from this side? We haven't had so many questions over this side. Yeah. It's not so much a question. It's perhaps just a, an observation maybe in terms of how we might have those difficult conversations about maybe the issues of climate change and around structural racism. Maybe the one big thing that of which we are all a part of, anyway, this evening, in which to have that conversation and to make a stand is by the very fact that we are the body of the church. We are a part of a massive institution while we admit there are failings even within that around, around race, prejudice, colonization, etc. But actually from our own either pulpits or our own pews, that we ourselves by our nature acknowledge every Sunday, whenever we come to church, that actually, yeah, human, the human race is far from perfect. We all make errors, we all make mistakes, we are all fallen human beings and to acknowledge that and just say sorry to God to actually be acknowledged and just say to ask for that forgiveness to God that actually the biggest ways we perhaps can change as a group is when we stand up in our yeah, our pulpits together on a Sunday to say yes actually as we lament perhaps our part this is us being honest with ourselves but as children of God as equal in that being that that prophetic word Maybe, yeah, we, we can start by working out here in churches, both individually, across deaneries, across dioceses, across all our churches. This is how we can mobilize, but we need to begin to move away from just sitting in our pews to actually be more acknowledging where we are 
this is what we need to do something about it. We are called to church to send out to live the gospel of equality, of change. And we need to be courageous advocates. We need to be prophetic in our own ways. And we can start with church. Because if we can't start with church, and we can't believe that God can't change in us and work through us, then this is just but four walls which might one day just crumble. Yeah, that's a good point. I think uh, Christians have some unique resources that we can bring to this whole conversation. Um, I think, you know, we can be confident in, in who we are and not always have to be right and defend ourselves. We can approach conversations with love and with humility and with patience. We have hope. We believe in impossible things. Those are good things to draw on. Yes. So here and then next one along. Can I first just say I've found this evening's talk really interesting. But at the same time, you've really riled me. <laughs> <laughs> talk, you know, linking it into racism. I mean, clearly there's a lot of disadvantaged people in the world, um, particularly in the, in the south and in the middle by the equator, etc., by affected. So, the term, you know, linking it to racism, to me, is wrong. Um, we should be talking about disadvantaged people. Yeah. I don't disagree in that, you know, I grew up in Madagascar and Kenya, surrounded by immense poverty. Um, and yes, absolutely, we need to talk about it in terms of wealth and poverty, which I did in brief. There's lots of books about climate change and wealth and poverty. So I wanted to write one about something that hadn't been talked about. I think it is really important when, and this is why I've mentioned it several times, that we talk about it as a structural racism issue uh, and not about racism as a matter of prejudice. Because if you are going to go around saying, oh, white people are racists because you've caused climate change and black people are suffering, well, obviously that's not true. That's not how it works. But structural racism, racism is that invisible there's invisible patterns that we see in society. If we were to go back to Madagascar and we were to say, look, there's lots of rich people and there's lots of poor people. Madagascar's really poor. Hang on a second. Why are all the rich people, why are all the white people in Madagascar rich? There's no poor white people in Madagascar. Why is that? Oh, it's because of colonial dynamics and the fact that the, the French colonial powers that were there have established themselves and so on. And so there were old racist patterns that persist in many of these places. We need to be able to pick those apart a little bit. But they are structural, and so we don't need to be upset by those. I understand that it is difficult to talk about, um, and poverty still matters too. Yeah, I do agree with that. Yes? I'm glad you spoke first, because my point is picking up on the language of racism. Um, in uh, Laudato Si, Pope Francis uses the term climate justice. Yeah. And of course, the Catholic Church has a long heritage of liberation theology, which is addressing specifically poverty and injustice and things along those lines. What I've read, it sounds like it hasn't had as big an impact as they hoped it would. Yeah. So perhaps using the language of Black Lives Matter, picking up on the cultural movement at the time, at, at this moment, is perhaps more helpful than just using the broader terms of climate justice because that hasn't had the impact that we'd hoped. Yeah. I mean, I only came to the idea of there being a structural racist dynamic in climate change because I was working on the economic injustices of climate change. I was working on that for 10 years before I started thinking about the racial dynamics, and I've been working on that for about five years. So they are interconnected, and that's why it's important. Yes, was there a question back there? Was, let me come around with the microphone. First of all, I want to thank you for everything you've said, which has been very uh, stimulating. But I think I want to uh, underline the danger that a number of other speakers have, have put in what I think is a reductionist approach <clears throat> and bringing it back to race. Mm. Um, it's not a, just a question of what's instrumental, it's a question of rigorous thinking. As Christians, race is only a subcategory of sin in the world. If you reduce everything to race, 
you have nothing that you can meaningfully say about, for example, a Nile country diverting the water from a lower Nile country, despite the fact that they're, they're non-white races, unless you go determinist-like and say, oh, well, it's all really because of the, the, um, the, the behaviour of the global north. Yeah, well, I agree, uh, and, and I certainly don't reduce everything to race, um, which is why we talked about geography at the beginning and why I talked about the economics of this. The, the racist dynamic to climate change is one of many different angles. Um, I wrote a book about it because I, didn't, I hadn't seen any other books about it. But there's obviously lots of other books about climate change, and I've written other books about climate change myself. So it's not the only way of looking at it. I do think it matters, but it's not the only factor, for sure. And, and we do need to be careful when there are people who are uh, very passionate about one thing, who do want to make everything about their one thing. So you're right about that. It is a fair warning. Yes? Is structural racism sinful? And if so, how do we repent? <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Um, th so this is a problem, isn't it? Because we could, get, we could have a long theological conversation here, probably. I don't know if we're very good at talking about structural sin and collective failings. But I think I do see that in the Bible. I do see that in the Old Testament in particular, when you get some of the prophets that um, talk about how the nation has failed. So it's, I think, probably because of um, sort of evangelical ways of thinking about the Bible, we've personalized faith a lot. And um, we live in a very individualistic culture, and so our personal faith in Jesus becomes the sort of center of the faith. But the Bible certainly has wider understandings of that. And I don't know, there must be ways of reclaiming those more collective understandings of, of wrong, whether we want to call it sin or whether we want to call it something else. Yeah, that's, I'll have to think about that one. But, I, but you're onto something, for sure. Yes, we've got... Yeah, here and then over here. If there'd, be, if there'd been no colonisation of Africa, been completely left on its own the last few hundred years, where would Africa stand as regards climate change? Um, well, so that's an interesting question. There's... Um, so it, there's a couple of different ways of answering that. One is that the effects of climate change would, ha would have happened regardless. Yeah. Um, the other thing to consider is how would Africa have developed or not developed outside of colonialism? And there's no way of knowing about that. There were very successful African kingdoms that were essentially demolished in the processes of colonialism. Um, I don't, I'm not a historian of those sorts of things, but I do know that Madagascar, for example, was actually surprisingly advanced um, and had, it had its own little industrial revolution in Madagascar that was wiped out by the French when they took over. History could have unfolded very differently in many parts of Africa if there hadn't been colonialism. But equally, you know, that's, that's speculation on our part, so it's very hard to know. What we do know is that the way things work at the moment in Africa is that oil and other fossil fuels that are produced in Africa are generally not burned in Africa, but are exported and burned somewhere else, and yet the consequences come back on Africa afterwards. And that is very difficult. Yes, over here and then here. We've been talking on, and, uh, this is slightly off the, um, the global, um, but I think we might just reflect on the fact that um, and this is a commercial, because one of the churches in uh, the deanery um, has for some years um, entertained the, um, or provided facilities for Friday prayers from Muslims. And um, uh, it was always slightly uh, odd. We, we always worried about these sh shoes being left outside one of the rooms. And, you know, we never kept got near. But um, we have now um, acquired um, an Afghan family who are now living in one of the houses we have in the parish, and um, that's opened up enormous opportunities because um, it's, it's been at some financial cost, and who came to our aid in, a, 
terms of the financial cost, but the local Jewish community. So we have had um, occasions when Muslims and Jews and Christians have got together. So I just mentioned that. It's something we can do rather than looking at the global structural situation of which we can't really do as individuals other than pray. We can't actually do very much. But I have to tell you, it's been quite interesting to get the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims together. Yeah. There's a couple of interesting things in that. One, one is... Um, oh, yes, we've got Sunnis and... I can't remember the other sorts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of interesting things there. One is when there, when there are relationships and when there's dialogue across cultures, that breaks down misunderstandings and the potential for misunderstandings, and that can be a really powerful thing. And one of the problems we have in climate change, as a, you know, in general, is that we don't hear African stories. We don't hear the voices of environmentalists from India or from small island states. People like me from Luton can come and speak here, but you're never going to hear Vanessa Nakate from Uganda. She's not going to come to Berkhampton and speak. And so we don't hear these stories. We don't get those wider perspectives, and that's why relationships across cultures are really important. The other thing that you mentioned there was um, we have a similar story in Luton. There was, a, um, was it an earthquake in uh, Pakistan, and um, no, it was floods. There was a floods last year is what, is what I'm thinking of. Um, and uh, immense devastation in Pakistan at the time, and Luton being a very multicultural town, um, there's lots of Islamic charities. Those Islamic charities put on lots of fundraisers for money for Pakistan, and those were all supported by local Jewish communities and Christian communities. And again, it was a way of working together to support people who were on the front lines of the climate crisis there. Yes, any other questions? I don't know how long, how long are we allowed to go on for? I mean, I'm happy to keep going, but... <laughs> yeah. um, we've talked quite a lot at a high level about climate justice mm. and you know, structural issues and the future. Um, I think we should also be thinking very carefully about what we can do now. And I've worked in South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo in the last 10 years on things like human rights and intercommunal violence, many of which, many of the conflicts stem from competition for resources. And there's so much that I think, you know, we should be thinking about what we can do to help. And it seems in recent years there's been a retreat from actually going in and working on sort of stabilisation and, for example, keep peacekeeping missions having, you know, budgets slashed. Yeah. So, you know, whilst we're talking at a high level, which will take a long time, is very difficult. I think there's a lot we can be doing now. No, you're absolutely right, and you know it's very easy with climate change to talk around in circles because this is a huge problem that's going to be going on for the next hundred years. These these issues are not going to be resolved in my lifetime, I don't think. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. We do need practical solutions, things we can do, things we can support. Some of those are going to be political things that we can call for. I think the way that the aid budgets were cut in the last couple of years was thoroughly unnecessary and done for political reasons. And then the diverting of money that had been going to support poor communities being spent here instead um, without really making a big deal of that. We need to call for that to be reinstated. Yeah. Any other? I've, I've, there's one over there and one over here. So I'll come over here first. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That was very interesting and impressive and distressing to, to look at. The, the interesting question really is what can we do? And uh, converting the, the West uh, from its racist uh, behavior, uh, good luck. Mm. Yeah. It, but yeah. Uh, what I <laughs> wanted to say was yep. there is something which is much more promising and it was there, but you didn't you didn't really emphasize it very much, you didn't mention it, which is the thing that actually gets people to do something is self-interest. Um, our country is going a little bit apoplectic about tiny numbers of people coming in boats to this country. Um, you're talking about numbers that are a multiple of 100 or 200 of of 
the, the sort of pressure of, race, of, of migration that we're talking about. It is absolutely colossal. And if people are bothered about the little bits of migration going on now, they'd better look at those maps and think that's coming on a massive scale. And you can't send them to Rwanda because Rwanda will be closed for residents. Well, that's true, isn't it? And that's, that's part of the tragedy is that um, one of the reasons why people have to leave their homes in the first place is often climate change. <clears throat> um, and yet you arrive in a country seeking refuge and you get sent back there. Um, yes, it is really important that we focus on what we can do. And I haven't spelt out in great detail um, what I would recommend us you know, each to go away and do, because I think, I think most of us know the kinds of things we could be doing. Um, and it's up to each of us to think about what's going to be the most useful uh, and productive thing, you know, ways to spend our time. Um, this afternoon I was working with uh, the council in Luton and um, a group of uh, 10 different schools that we're working with to try and encourage those schools to look at their carbon footprint and how they teach climate change um, in the schools and incorporate that into the, the curriculum that they're working with what they can be doing to be planting gardens and planting trees and in encouraging kids to cycle to school. And we've got these sort of 10 schools that we're doing a little pilot with. Um, it might be something like that that you might want to get involved in with some volunteering, or it might be something with the Eco Church program. There will be something that you could um, go away and get involved in, I'm sure. Was there one more question over here? Yes. It's, it's actually it overlapped greatly with the, the, the previous uh, question, but thank you, thank you very much. Um, it, it seems to me that all we've been talking about is pulling Malcolm X's dagger out just that first three inches. And so it was really, I was wanting to try and say, well, are there other effective things we can do? Because it seems to me that all of the attempts of people of goodwill are puny, frankly, against, against the economic forces fueled by the self-interest that we unwittingly take part in in the West. That was one point. The other point which gave me a bit of hope was that actually there is a very strong church in Kenya, very strong church in Uganda, that there are Christian brothers and sisters. And can we be used by them as their resource for this? That was all. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. So, thank you. Um, having gone to school in Kenya, I still know um, a good number of people out there. Um, one of my good friends from school runs a, a tree planting uh, charity out there. And so one of the things that I've done with some of my own giving is to give to his organization um, and fund uh, forest rangers, along with some other friends of mine. We fund a small team of uh, forest rangers that plant trees and then look after those trees and uh, cut um, fire breaks. So when you get forest fires in the forest, it is contained within one area and various things like that. And that's, that's again, it's all about relationships. And it's about um, using volunteers, and it includes churches in this forest in Kenya, um, where we have those connections to be at the service of those people who are on the front lines. Yes, when we look at the bigger question of how we make good on this stuff... Um, and healing that wound, as Malcolm X was suggesting. That is a long-term process. Um, there are friends of mine who are activists who talk about climate reparations. That's a very complicated term, and there's no real agreement on what that involves, and I don't tend to use it myself because I'm, I feel like I have a lot more learning to do on that. So for me, it's much more about relationships at this point. Um, people like Tear Fund, of course, work with churches and through churches, so if that's a, a charity that you want to support, they are working through churches in places like Kenya and other parts of the world. And where there are those relationships, you know that the money is going to the right places and you can, you can hear from the people who are, who are benefiting from what we can bring and we can in turn learn from them and hear their stories. Relationships are really important to all of this. And it takes people seriously, which is the most important thing. When we're talking about climate change, it's easy to talk about percentages of carbon emissions and dates and projections, but the more we can talk about people and real lives, the better. Thank you. It's all been really interesting. Um, but I'm hearing this almost the same old thing, which is 
going right back to what you said at the start, which was about we can do things individually, but it's more, more important to get involved as a community and have a bigger impact because all, this, all these individual things that we go away and do and make us feel better, they just get diluted and they get lost and nothing at the top or further up the chain ever happens going to that to what someone just asked about what can we do. And I think as Christians, we actually need to be doing something and there's lots of talk around this so-called, among other activists, the so-called moderate flank, whereby they are, we are people who don't want to get too extreme as it was, but we want to do something that ties in with the sort of XR um, 3%, the tipping point. We just need 3% to get active and get involved. Then the politicians and the economic impact begins to have a difference. So I think that's a role where the church and where we can get involved as the moderate flank and really come together as a voice. So yes, do those things that make us feel good and is sort of people around us can see us doing that but we've we've got to combine somehow and make a bigger impact and as a church I think that's where we should be going. Yes and, and there's lots of organizations that can help with that if, if anybody was, does want to do the radical thing then Christian Climate Action are um, the most radical Christian group you'll find working on these sorts of issues that's the Christian branch of XR um, and they're a really interesting group some of what they do is too extreme but it is a really interesting question, this idea of how you have moderate groups and radical groups that support each other and that are on the same team. And this is something that I've tried to work out in Luton where we have an XR group that can sometimes be a little bit wild and uh, sometimes just missing people who will go and actually do the work afterwards. So you say, let's get the council to declare a climate emergency, great. So we'll have some protests and, we'll, and then they do it. Now who's going to work with the council to work out what that means? And there's a huge, there's a huge role for people to be playing those, that patient, proactive, um, but keep pushing and keep making things happen without necessarily doing the, the protest stuff, but to do the hard work, to build the relationships, and to be that moderate flank. Yeah, that is really important. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Yes. I've just come across the definition of a word which keeps getting banded around a lot when we look at our uh, media much, which I think in the light of this evening's conversation and reflections, uh, I hope we perhaps can have some sort of agreement on that perhaps we need to be alert to racial prejudice and discrimination, be it within society, within the climate, etc. And so I wonder if really then we all need to be woke. <laughs> that's what it means, right? Well, that's, that's a word that I uh, very definitely avoid uh, because, it's, because it's almost never used honestly in this country. But if you look at where it came from, it just means to be alert to injustice. And so if we were able to use it honestly, then absolutely, I, I agree with you. Because it's a word that's been co-opted and has become uh, a laughing stock, and now it's sort of a... It's an umbrella term for anything that you don't like. I, 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 don't, I don't use it myself, but you are, you are right. Yeah. You're standing up with purpose back there. I will, oh. I'll hand you the mic. Hand. That's absolutely fine. First of all, thank you. Jeremy, for the uh, lecture and just leading us in the discussion. Um, the reference of your name to Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah, I guess, had to carry the burden of telling the truth with all that that brought. And, uh, and in terms of what you said and the questions, there was a sort of inter, I suppose the interconnectedness of our world. And uh, we've used our resources to cause harm our challenge is how we use our resources to do good. And uh, I think this feels like a, a challenging discussion. And, uh, and I guess we have to be. But we are concerned with the truth and with justice. So thank you so much. We're really grateful.